Let's first start with a word of prayer and then we'll dive into our study tonight here in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Lord, it is good to be in your house. Your word says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And it is good to be here, Lord, in your presence, to come in the middle of the week and to just kind of shake off the first part of the week and, and give it all to you, Lord, the good and the bad part of our week so far. And uh, Lord, we just commit ourselves to you now as we open up your word and pray you'd speak to us through the story of David and here in 1 Samuel. And Lord, just move in our own hearts tonight. Minister to us right where we are, Lord. You know where each of us is. You know what we need. You know what we're going through. You know difficulties. You know burdens that people carried in here. And we thank you that you're our great burden bearer. So, Lord, just lighten our load tonight. Take, take the burdens. You, you tell us, cast our cares. You invite us to do that. That we should cast our cares upon you because you care for us. So we thank you, Lord. We lift up our cares and our worries, our burdens, and we just commit this time to you, Lord. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. First Samuel chapter 16 is where we are tonight. I'm going to read middle of verse 11 down through verse 13, uh, just so we can refresh ourselves where we left off last week. So middle of verse 11, it says, and Samuel, that's the prophet, said to Jesse, that's David's father, Send and bring him, meaning the last of the eight sons that Jesse somehow decided was not necessary to bring uh, before Samuel, as Samuel was choosing the next king of Israel. And so, and so he says to, to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. And so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. For this is the one. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. There's the first mention of his name here in the book of 1 Samuel. The Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So he went home because his work was done. The Lord had told the prophet Samuel to anoint the next king of Israel. God had determined that Saul was not capable of leading the people. And so God had rejected Saul as king. And Saul was the first king of Israel. And uh, the people demanded a king. And so God gave them a king in order for them to see just how miserable they're going to be. <laughs> With, with an earthly king, and, and Saul failed miserably. He disobeyed God. He was a disobedient king. He got off to a good start, but he didn't finish well. Now, Saul will continue to rule and reign for a couple more decades. Uh, but well in advance of Saul's replacement, God says to Samuel, I want you to choose king number two. And so Samuel goes there to the house of Jesse. Jesse has eight sons, but he only thought it necessary to bring seven of the eight sons in front of Samuel, thinking that the seven were really worthy of per perhaps being a king. But the eighth, the little one, the youngest one, is out in the field tending sheep, and we're not even going to bother to bring him in the house. And that's the one that God had determined. And Samuel went down each of the sons, and we got through all seven. He said to Jesse, is there not another one? Because none of these guys is the one that the Lord's telling me is king. And Jesse's like, yeah, there's a little shepherd kid. You know, he's a little ruddy. You know, he's the runt of the family. He's, he's, he's taking care of the sheep. The Bible describes David as good looking and ruddy. So he probably had a reddish appearance, probably auburn hair, which is an anomaly. But you will find some Israelis who have this kind of a... A, uh, a physical characteristics where they have like auburn hair. They can even have, it's, it's possible that when it says here that David had bright eyes, that it means he had blue eyes and reddish hair. And he was a good looking guy, but he wasn't um, in Jesse's mind, in his dad's mind, king material. But, um, but the Lord um, recognizes things that we don't. Um, he looks at the heart and not the outward appearance. And so Jesse finally brings him in and and Saul anoints him with oil. The anointing of oil was an ancient way of setting someone aside for specific godly purposes. It was typically done for priests, but also done for kings. And so Samuel takes out a horn, which was a hollow horn of an ox or, or um, some other animal. And um, he has olive oil in it and he pours it over David. You're the next king. But David is only 10 years old, maybe 15 at the most. Scholars believe somewhere 10 to 15 and and a lot of them end up on the lower end of that scale. So he's just a kid. He will not be king for another 
15 to 20 years. He becomes king, he reigns as king when he's 30. And so this is when we're introduced now here to David. Um, his uh, name in Hebrew is pronounced David, and his name translates beloved. He's the only David in the Bible. There are many names that uh, you see often mentioned in the Bible, and you have to figure out which, which Samuel is this, which, you know, which person is this. But David, there's only one in the entire Bible. And he becomes a central theme. He dominates the rest of the Bible. This is a, this is a man that God has selected uh, and we're not finished with David either. We see him appearing in the Millennial Kingdom, but that's another Bible study. But here's an example of how he dominates Scripture, because the royal line of Israel will be known as the House of David. Jerusalem will be known as the City of David, because that's where he reigned. Bethlehem will be known as the Town of David. That's where he was born. Most of the Psalms are known as the Psalms of David, and Messiah, Jesus, is known as the Son of David, because he's of the line of, of David. And David's life is divided into four stages. We mentioned this last week, just a quick summary. The, his life is divided into these four stages, the shepherding years, the hiding years when he's on the run from Saul, the fighting years, and the reigning years. And we looked at a couple of quick principles from chapter 16 last week. And this first one I neglected to mention, so this one might be new for some of you, but it's really taken from verse seven and it's worth remembering here because uh, out, of, out of verse seven, it says, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him, talking about Saul, for the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It's a famous passage that many of us are familiar with if you've been around the Bible for very long. So one of the takeaways, the principle from chapter 16 is just this, number one, that people are impressed with the external with image and appearance, but God is concerned with the internal, it's the heart, that's what matters most. We live in a very uh, materialistic uh, society where people are all concerned about how they look and the impression that they make and what their image is in, you know, in front of other people, and God is just not interested in that kind of thing. What God is concerned about is the heart, and, and that's what he sees in David versus Saul. Saul was tall, the Bible says, a head and shoulders above anybody else. He was good looking. He looked like a king. He had the appearance of a king, but his heart was not right with God. And what God wants in all of us is the heart. And it doesn't really matter the outward external appearance. What, what God is interested in is the heart. And then the other thing that I mentioned at the close of our study last week, this is where we left off, is that God is working in the waiting. And what I mean by that is here young David is, again, maybe 10, 15 at the most, being anointed to be the next king of Israel, but he won't actually reign for another 15 to 20 years. And during that 15 to 20 years, God will teach David much. It's not wasted years. Those are years where he still is a shepherd, and he's going to learn how to identify with God, relate to God, hear God. He's going to learn about tending sheep in the same way that he will tenderly tend people to reign over them. God's going to teach him much as a young shepherd. And those will also be years where he will be on the run from Saul. Saul will literally, as we will read later, try to kill this guy because Saul is threatened by young David because he knows this is my successor. And so he's constantly fearful, Saul, paranoid. Um, he's wanting to control everything. And so he literally, at different times, tries to kill David. And David is on the run for about 15 years of his life, uh, just running from Saul. And, and uh, this is when he heads down to En Gedi, down by the Dead Sea. And this is when he hides in, in, the, in the rocks and in the caves. And this is where he talks about, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. You know, he, he, he even takes advantage of the topography and, and, the, and the scenery to, to uh, draw near to the Lord. And, you know, as a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts after you. There's only one spring down by the Dead Sea and then Gedi. That's where David would hide. And as he would draw water from this one spring in the middle of the desert, that's when he would write these things about, as a deer pants for water, so my soul thirsts after you. I mean, they, these will be teachable years. 
And so the point in sharing this as a principle for us is God is working in the waiting. Some of you are in a period of waiting for whatever it might be. Maybe you're, you're waiting um, to get married. Maybe you're waiting to have kids. Maybe you're waiting for that career that, that, you, that you would like uh, or whatever the case might be, waiting to move, waiting for something. You know, don't get impatient because it is in those waiting years that, that God can do wonderful things in your heart to prepare you, to refine you. Uh, you know, there's some things that, like an onion that need to be peeled off layer by layer, and God will reveal some things to us. But look, you know, when God moved in the hearts and lives of people, it often uh, was preceded by years of waiting. David would, would wait some 15 to, to 20 years. Uh, uh, Paul, when he had his conversion experience as Saul on the road to Damascus, it would be 10 years before he would preach his first evangelistic gospel message and lead anybody to Christ. Moses had to wait 40 years. Uh, Jesus, think about it. I mean, from the time he was born until his public ministry was 30 years. I mean, you know, God will take his time to do his good work. The waiting is not in vain. I just, somebody needs to hear that tonight. Uh, and it is so counterintuitive to what we're used to because in our culture, we want everything instantly. And if it doesn't happen by Thursday, we get mad at God. How many of you can relate to what I'm saying? Come on, let's be honest. Like, yes. And so we, we are, we're impatient because that's the way our culture is now. Everything is supposed to be instant. Instant rice, instant pudding. Everything is instant. You, you stand in front of you. Have you ever stood in front of your microwave impatiently, right? It's like, why isn't this thing faster? It's because that's how we're wired. I, I read this report, this, this study that McDonald's did two years ago. They commissioned a study in South Florida because one of their chains of restaurants in South Florida, they were getting complaints from customers that the drive through was taking too long. And so McDonald's commissioned a study and they found that from the time somebody gave their order at this particular McDonald's chain, from the time they got their, gave their order, when you talk into the box, right? Until you actually got the food, it was three minutes, nine and a half seconds. And McDonald's says, that's way too long. Way too long. What was their goal? From the time you give your order till you get your food, 60 seconds. That's McDonald's goal as a corporation, 60 seconds. So guess what? If we don't get our food in 60 seconds, we're like complaining, we're mad, like what's wrong with you people? Well, therefore, translate that. Now, like how do we wait on God? It's like, God, you're taking longer than 60 seconds. Yeah, he might take six decades. Get used to it. <laughs> right? Now, I hope not. Right? None of us want to wait 60 years, wait till I find my perfect spouse. You're never going to find the perfect spouse anyway, friends. So forget that. There is no perfect spouse. Okay? You're like, I'm just waiting for my stud. No, he's a spud. Okay? He's a potato head. He's a potato head. There is no perfect guy. There's no perfect lady. But God in his timing will bring about his perfect will if we learn to wait upon the Lord. David would write in Psalm 37, 7, because he, he learned this, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Psalm 38, 15, I wait for you, O Lord, you will answer, O Lord my God. This is David. Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. So we have to, we have to learn, especially in our fast-paced culture, we have to learn the discipline of waiting on the Lord. And his perfect timing is always perfect. Well, when the story transitions here to verse 14, it's very tragic because when David gets anointed as the next king of Israel, even though he's just a boy and he won't reign for another 15 or 20 years, verse 14 says, look in your Bibles now, let's carry on reading. Verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Okay. What kind of a spirit is this? This is, a, this is an evil spirit that the Lord has allowed. Now, understand the character and nature of God. God does not promote evil. He doesn't produce evil. But he will allow sometimes evil to have its way to accomplish God's purposes. So he permits 
He permits an evil spirit to torment Saul. It's part, really, of God's hand of judgment against this guy because he's been disobedient to the Lord. And this evil spirit has caused him trouble. It's a distressing spirit. It has caused him trouble. The Hebrew word for trouble can translate fear or uh, he's terrified. And so fear comes over Saul. It, it's going to start to dominate his life. He becomes a man who is not only fearful, but he's a man who is uh, uh, paranoid. And, and this is going to um, really disturb him. And uh, verse 15, and Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who was skillful. It was a skillful player of the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you and you shall be well. And so Saul's attendant said, you know what we need to do? We need to have, we need to have some soothing music for you. And so we need to find somebody who's skilled in playing the harp. Now, don't, don't think of a harp like the kind, you know, on wheels that, you know, is long and an orchestra and somebody, you know, leans it back against their shoulder. This is more like a lyre. It's a small instrument. It was back in the day, it was kind of the equivalent of a guitar, but it, but it was more of an upright um, and, but it had stringed, it was a stringed instrument. And they're, they're saying, you know, what we need to find is somebody who can play some, you know, soothing uh, music for you and, and uh, some elevator music. That's what you need. So verse 17, and so Saul said to his servants, well, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. And then one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite who was skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Okay, pause for a moment. He's talking about David. Now, David, at this point, so as the story transitions, um, he's, he's a little bit older here, but when this guy says he's a mighty man of valor, a, a, a mighty man of war, it is speaking of his courageous spirit, not, not that he's old enough to go into battle yet. Because we're going to see in, in the next chapter, he's not old enough to fight in the Israeli army against Goliath. So he's still a young guy. He's probably a teenager by the time he, he fights Goliath. So he's somewhere now, a little bit older than when he was anointed, but not old enough to go to battle. So probably young in his teen years. And this guy's like, now listen, Saul does not yet know that David is his replacement. The, the whole anointing happened privately in Jesse's home. So Saul does not know the person that God has selected to replace him. So this is all God's providential timing here where Saul's servant goes, you know what, I know this young, this young guy. He's fierce, he's courageous. And why does he say that? He has a reputation of being courageous because in chapter 17, we're going to see by David's own testimony, that guy, while he was tending sheep, killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. And, uh, and he lived to tell about it. And so he's got that reputation. It's like this, this guy, you know, he, he kills lions with his bare hands. And, uh, and so he's a mighty man here. So, and so therefore, verse, 19, verse uh, uh, 19, and so therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who was with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by his son David to Saul. Okay, because it, because like, I'm not going to send my son empty handed to the king. So we're going to, we're going to load him up with some gifts. And verse 21, and so David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. And then Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, the troubling spirit, that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. And then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. All right, two, two, two things from what we just read here, two more, two principles from, from chapter 16. First of all, disobedience to God invites distress for us. Um, the distressing spirit, this, this evil spirit that God allowed, that God permitted to, to uh, trouble Saul was because of Saul's disobedience. And I'm not suggesting that every time we disobey God, he's going to allow a demonic spirit to come and torment us. But I think the principle still is noteworthy that we only invite hardship in our lives when we disobey God. I mean, that's just a standard 
principle of Christianity 101 that we need to get. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. We invite hardship into our lives. Look, living in a fallen world is hard enough, but when we sin against God, we're inviting even more hardship into our lives because of our disobedience. And so we, we can learn this from Saul. Saul disobeyed God. God was patient with Saul, not once, but twice. At the, after the second time, God says, I'm done with you. I've rejected you as king. And part of his judgment here is this tormenting spirit. So we need to be mindful of the fact that we invite additional hardship into our lives when we disobey God. That's just the way it's going to go down. And, and so learn from Saul's mistakes here. Let, let, let us take warning from it. And, but then the other thing that is good to note is worship soothes the soul. Um, there is some intrinsic value in, in worship. Now, let me back up and say this. There's only one object of our worship, and that's the Lord. So I'm not saying worship God to get something. But I, what I am saying is when we worship God, there is this natural intrinsic benefit to worship that is a blessing to our own souls. You might have noticed if you perhaps came in here with a heavy heart, I felt this, that you can come into God's house, you have maybe a heavy heart, you're burdened by something, and you just start to worship the Lord, and you, and you lift your hands in praise, and you just lift your voice, and you, and you don't even necessarily feel, feel like worshiping, but the more you do, there's just this natural benefit of God breathing His presence into your heart and lifting your soul. And so, so never discount just the wonder of worship, because as we worship the Lord, there's this natural result that happens for us. Sometimes it's good just, you know, when you're in your car or you're, you know, at home or whatever, that you turn on the radio you, or you hit Pan, Pandora on your phone and you just hit some worship music and, and you just fill the room with worship. And as God is exalted, there's this wonderful thing that begins to just happen in our souls. And, and so, you know, here's, here Saul is tormented by this spirit, but as David plays, and David's this worshiper, you know, he wrote 75% of the Psalms inspired by the Holy Spirit. As he, as he, as he worships, you know, God is soothing Saul's soul. And it's a good reminder to us. All right, chapter 17, let's keep reading, because this, this is the big chapter. A lot of people don't even go to church or are familiar with this story. This is the story of David and Goliath. And, and so chapter 17 says, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Sukkoth. Sukkoth is about 15 miles due west of Bethlehem, which belongs to Judah. And they encamped between Sukkot and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Okay, so, you know, they're, they're drawing up battle lines, and... And the Philistines are on one mountain, and the Israelites are on another. they got a valley in between them, and there's this bit of a standoff. And the Philistines are going to showcase one massive man who will intimidate them and cause them great fear. And, of course, his name is, is Goliath. And so we're introduced to him in the next verse, verse 4. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. All right, now, a cubit in ancient measurement, a cubit is roughly 18 inches. A cubit is the distance between, in general, a man's elbow and his middle finger. So that length is a cubit. That's how they would measure a cubit. So it's roughly 18 inches. And then a span is the distance of a man's hand roughly between his pinky to his thumb. It's about nine inches. And so he is six cubits, six times 18 inches, and another nine inches. So this guy stands nine feet, nine inches tall. All right, now, 
This is where some people who, you know, are skeptical about Christianity and the Bible, and they go, come on, you know, you don't honestly believe there's a guy who's nine feet, nine inches tall. So let me just take a moment to kind of address where did the giants come from? There were giants in the land. The Bible records giants, and we are first introduced to them. And if you want to take your Bibles and go back, or you could just listen, but in Genesis chapter 6, uh, because Goliath is a descendant of this race of people that came about because of a strange uh, uh, occurrence of events. And so in Genesis chapter 6, it says this, verse 1, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, that's an important phrase, I'll qualify it in a minute, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And there were giants, verse 4 says, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, after the flood, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. All right, so it says here that the sons of God cohabitated with the daughters of men. What does this phrase mean? What in fact happened here? The phrase sons of God in Hebrew is Banai Ha'elohim. Banai Ha'elohim is used uh, only three other places in the Old Testament, and every place it is used, it speaks of angels. Baha ha Elohim. And the angels are the sons of God here in Genesis 6, but in its context, these are fallen angels. So Satan has already rebelled. He's already led a rebellion in heaven. Revelation says he led a third of the stars in rebellion with him. So how many are a third of the angels? We don't know how many that represents, but probably thousands, if not tens of thousands. And those fallen angels are now known as demons. These fallen angels somehow, there's not a lot of description here, somehow took on physical appearance because we know that angels in the Bible can and did take on physical appearance. These fallen angels took on physical appearance they cohabitated with earthly women, and the result was a giant race of people. The Bible records a, a, a bunch of different races that fall in that category of giant races. The Nephilim, in fact, when it says in Genesis 6, 4, what I just read, that there were giants on the earth, the word giants uh, in Hebrew is Nephilim. Nephilim means fallen ones. So you have different things in the Bible, different races that are mentioned, Nephilim, Rephaites, Zuzites, Emites, Horites, and Anakites. Those different groups of people mentioned in the Old Testament fall under the category of giant races of people. Now, I know this sounds kind of like sci-fi, and this is just like, for some people, it's like, this is really a strange thing. It is a strange thing. You see them before the flood, you also see them briefly after the flood. Because Joshua uh, uh, records them. 2 Samuel 21, we get to 2 Samuel. They, they, they are uh, written about still um, because they, they still existed before and after the flood. They were not wiped off. And yet then they mysteriously pay, uh, fade off the pages of the Bible. So we don't know what really happened to them. But um, there is a, a guy mentioned... In Deuteronomy 3.11, you don't need to turn there, his name is Og, he was king of Bashan, he was of the Rephaites, okay, part of this giant race, and in Deuteronomy 3.11, it says that his bed measured 13 and a half feet long by six feet wide, because he was a giant of a man, okay. So, um, what we read about Goliath back here in 1 Samuel 17 is that he fell among the giant races. And it is believed he was part of the Rephaites. Why do we say that? Because he's from Gath, and the Rephaites lived in Gath. So I know this seems like, again, really sci-fi kind of stuff, but, but there were giant races of people on the earth. And I'm not going to make it a whole study about the Nephilim and the giant races, but um, you, can, you can read extensively about them. Uh, it was one of the reasons why the spies, if you remember, when initially... The spies uh, were sent into, Moses sent uh, uh, 12 spies into 
the promised land to spy out the land before they uh, went into the promised land. And 10 came back with a bad report. And what was part of their bad report? We've seen giants in the land. And we appear as grasshoppers, like, like in, in size and in perspective. And so because of that, a, a bad report spread among the Israelites. And only two, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, 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 okay, maybe there's giants in the land, but we could take them because the Lord's on our side. And only Joshua and Caleb would go into the promised land. All of that current generation would die in the wilderness because they didn't believe God. And only their children would go into the promised land with Joshua and Caleb. So the giant race of people have been around in the Old Testament, and Goliath is part of this giant race of people. And he stands here nine feet, nine inches tall. And uh, it tells us in verse 5, I'm back here in 1 Samuel 17, verse 5, that he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels. Now, you read different commentaries, and it's anywhere from 125 pounds to 200 pounds. That's how much this coat of mail weighed on this giant of a man. You know, ho, 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 uh, green giant. All right. And so here he comes out with, uh, you know, 125 to 200 pounds of, of uh, weight on him, this coat of mail out of bronze. Verse 6, and he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders, because he was like, you know, was hung between his shoulders. And now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. So that translates to about 13 to to 17 pounds, just the, just the head of a spear, okay? Um, and a shield bearer went before him. Why does he need one? I don't know, but he's got a shield bearer before him. You go out, you carry my shield, okay. And then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, and he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. I should have worked it out with the sound guys to like do some kind of a giant voice on my microphone <laughs> when I read that. But anyway, and verse 10, and the Philistine said, he adds, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed, circle that in your Bibles, and greatly afraid. Dismayed in Hebrew is chatat. It means terrified or broken. This is, these, are your, these are your strongest fighting men of the Israeli army, and they are terrified, and they are broken. Now, this is a reminder to us, and this isn't the first time we're going to see a statement about their fear. We're going to see it also in verse 24, but it's a principle for us because the enemy will always play on your fears. The enemy will always play on your fears. And why is this important for us to remember? Because oftentimes the greatest battle against what the enemy plants in our heads, you know, the way he whispers things that can stir fear in our hearts is this battle of the mind to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Because first, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So fear does not come from the Lord. That is either from our own flesh or that is from the enemy trying to rattle us. Fear is not from the Lord. And we have to fight with everything in us when we get into those times of tremendous fear you ever been in those moments of just tremendous fear where it's all you can do to just keep your head above water? You don't want to drown in the fear, but we have to remind ourselves and pray through it. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. 1 John 4.8 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Well, the Bible says God is love. He is perfect love. So the more I have of him, the less fear I have in me. And we have to work. We have, this is a battle Man, just like, just like Goliath comes out here to, to try to make the whole army afraid, and he succeeds. The enemy of our souls is going to always try to use fear to cripple us. And we have to fight that. And we have to constantly be giving our fears to the Lord, our worries to the Lord, our anxiety to the Lord, because that is a common tactic of the enemy. 
Let's keep reading. Verse 12. Now David was the son of the Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, his dad, who, and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years, in the days of Saul. So talking about Jesse. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to battle. The names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, the youngest of the eight. And the three oldest followed Saul, but David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So in other words, David just sometimes went to the battlefield to just kind of look over the shoulders of his brothers, but he wasn't old enough to fight. He was a shepherd boy. So he'd come and see, how's the battle going, guys? And then he'd go back home and tend sheep. It says in verse 16, and the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So that's the standoff here between these two armies. Goliath would present himself every morning and every evening for 40 days. So 80 times he's presented himself and taunted the Israeli army. 80 times taunting them. Goliath is the first trash talker of the Bible, you know? <laughs> and he's like, oh, you miserable, weak, you know, Israel. He's like, who do you guys think you are? We're, we're the Philistines and I'm Goliath, you know? And he's just going on about this, ta taunting them. Hoping what? Hoping that they'll retreat and just give up and run. So he's happy to come out every day for 40 days because they don't have to fight. They don't have to die in war. And he's just hoping to intimidate them enough that they'll give up and run. Well, it says in verse 17, And then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. Okay, again, because David's not old enough to fight in the, bat, in, the, in the war. So he's not, he's not yet 20 years old. He had to be 20 or older in order to fight in the army. Verse 18, he says, And carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. And now Saul and they, and all the men of Israel, were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And so David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things, and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in a battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. And then he talked with them. And there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Now, you know, here's the scene. David is this young kid. By the way, you're going to see here a little bit later that, like, the brothers are like, you know, scram. Like, like get it. we're fighting here. You, you, you should be tending sheep like you're just a kid. At this time, David is thought to be somewhere around 15 to 17 years of age now. And so he's too young to fight in the battle. And he's like, you know, thanks for the cheese, but go home. Like, like get out of here. And so scram, little kid. But he comes and he's hearing Goliath taunt the Israeli army. And really, by extension, Goliath is taunting the God of Israel. And David hears this. And so keep reading verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. There's that verse again about fear. That's the enemy's tactic. And so the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king, will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. What's this? Yeah, King Saul has actually given an incentive to any man in his army if you're brave enough to go out and fight Goliath, here's what you're going to get. Three things. This is the reward, okay? You're going to get great riches. You're going to get my daughter, my youngest daughter in marriage. And your father, meaning your household too, and your father's descendants, will be exempt from taxes for the rest of their lives. That's the incentive. And so the, the, the guys in the Israeli army are talking about this. You know, you've, we've heard King Saul, they're like, you know, you know you're going to get rich and you get his daughter for a wife and we get tax exemption. This is a pretty good deal. David's hearing this, right? David's hearing this. In verse, verse 26, and then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what? 
What's this? What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, tough kid with a staff, but he is. He is tough. And he wants to hear, what, what's the reward again? Now, mind you, he's like 17. All right? Every 17-year-old boy wants to know, what's the pay and who's the girl I get and no taxes? Right? So this is intriguing to him. But even beyond that, I mean, this guy has a heart for the Lord. He wants to defend the reputation of the living God. And so verse 27, and the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be for the man who kills him. Now, verse, verse 28, now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness, little shepherd boy? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. You know, proud little brat. And, and so David said, look at the next verse, what have I done now? What have I done now? What have I done? Can you just see these brothers like back and forth, you know, the oldest brother's like, get out of here, kid. And he's like, what? What have I done now? And he goes and he adds, David adds, is there not a cause? I love that question because he's saying like, there's a reason we have to fight. Is there not a cause here? Like, like God's name, God's name is being, is being slandered here by this Philistine giant. And you guys are just sitting around here not doing anything about it. Is there not a cause? Now, I, I, I want to glean one other point out of this. Number two, listen, because this is important. When you decide to get serious with God, you can expect to have your critics. David is this young guy, but he's serious about God. And when he gets serious about God, Eliab is the first one to shame him and to ridicule him. Look, when you get serious about God, you will have your critics. There will be people who will say to you things that are maligning and demeaning. Um, whatever their motive is, jealousy, or um, you, you have, you know, uh, a measure of joy that they don't, and so they're, they're upset with you, or, or, or just because you love Jesus, have you ever gotten this? Just because you love Jesus, somebody thinks that you think that you're better than they are, which, which you should never think that, okay? We're all sinners saved by grace, but people who have not entered into that relationship with Jesus instantly think, oh, you must think you're better than me now. You got Jesus, so you think you're better than me. Oh, aren't you proud? You know, and that's what Eliab is saying here. You're proud, you're proud. He's not proud. He's just delivering cheese and crackers. He's delivering cheese and crackers, and he wants to fight for the name of the Lord, his God. That's it. But your critics will accuse you of a whole bunch of things. Because they don't get what you, what you have with God. And so, out of whatever their motive, uh, they will criticize, they will malign, they will demean. Don't let it rattle you. And so, verse 30, and then they turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Uh, let's just read a couple more verses, then we're going to pause for communion. Verse 31, And now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. And then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, because of the Philistine of, of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So praise God. He's volunteering. I'm, I'm the guy. The rest of your army is just sitting around eating cheese and crackers that I brought but I'm going to go out, I'm going to fight this guy. And we'll pick it up there. It's an interesting conversation between him and King Saul. But let's pause tonight to receive communion together. Let's pray first. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for this story that many of us are already familiar with. But Lord, we pray for fresh eyes and ears to hear what you would say to us through this story, Lord. Thank you that you are so gracious to us. We pray that you would protect us from the enemy who loves to whisper fearful things into our heads. That we would fight against fear and worry and anxiety. We trust you, Lord. And when we get serious about you, there will be people who will criticize and demean. Let them say what they might want to say, Lord. We want to follow you. Let the critics bark all they want. 
we want to follow you. We're so thankful that you love us so much that you gave your son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. And as we draw near to the table of the Lord tonight, we pray that the broken body and shed blood of our Lord would be a precious reminder to us of how much you love us, that you would die for us, to save us from our sins. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.